All right, what's going on everyone? So today we're gonna work on uh, collision detection. Now, it's not the collision detection that I wanted to work on. I wanted to work on uh, OBB and uh, I actually got a lot of it done and then I was like, you know what? I want to do something unique with uh, my collision detection, and I want it to be very easy to incorporate, um, like soft bodies and uh, rigid bodies and stuff like that. So we haven't gotten that far yet. So before I do the whole OBB thing, I want to get rigid bodies at least uh, somewhat going before uh, I do OBB. So in this episode, we're gonna do AABB, and don't really be discouraged. I mean, there's there's a lot of games that only use AABB, uh, like top-down RPGs, like older styles. A lot of those still use uh, AABB. And we're not gonna do just detection, we're also doing resolution. So we're gonna be resolving the collision. And my brain is completely not working hardly at all today. Uh, so hope, hopefully we can still get that done on the fly. Now I'm gonna go over some of the things that I have already done and uh, then we will uh, get get on to it. So firstly, uh, one thing that I know is, really? <laughs> okay, I'll get you something more to eat here in a few minutes, okay? Okay. Um, Yeah, he completely just threw me off track again. Um, so what I did notice or remembered is that we didn't have depth testing, depth testing going. And I completely just wasn't even thinking whenever we wrote the FBO class and have not been thinking this whole time because we haven't had overlapping sprites. Uh, so I had to add that in. So inside of the renderer, uh, down in the render method, I had to add GL depth buffer bit to the GL clear. And I also added GL enable GL depth test right here above the clear color. Now inside of GL or inside of the uh, binding of the FBO, I have this method right here. It's really simple. It just creates a depth buffer attachment. And that's all it is. So it's pretty much just like the, uh, just like the texture attachment, like just a regular texture attachment. This is just for depth. And right up here, I added an integer depth buffer ID. And right here, I'm saying depth buffer ID equals create depth buffer attachment. And inside of the bind frame buffer, I added this line right here which is GL bind render buffer, and then binding it to the render buffer and using the depth buffer ID, and of course, unbinding it. Somebody had mentioned before, I know he was trolling, but uh, in case anybody doesn't really know why you unbind is, uh, it's more of like a feature thing, so it always defaults back to whatever's bound or whatever has the ID of zero. That's really the only reason why. In fact, you don't 
have to unbind because whenever you bind, you just replace it. But yeah. Most people unbind because, well, that's what you learn. And it's always tidying up. Okay, and I believe that is it for the FBO. Now what we need is the ability to differentiate the Z value. So in order to tell if a sprite should be on top or below an, another sprite that it would be over or whatever. For instance, if you have uh, grass laid down and then you had like a fence, the fence obviously would render on top of the grass so the fence would have a higher depth value because in our case, the higher the value, the closer it is to the screen, although that would be negative, I think. I don't know, whatever. But in our case, it would be higher. So in order to do that, we need a value. And that value right here is depth. So in the game object, wait, variables need to be after object creation and behavior creation. When did I put that for? When did I put that there? I don't know. That's stupid looking though. And that, of course, is not new. Because we've had that for a while. Okay. So we have a public float depth, which is going to be equal to zero. So everything is standard going to be zero. And if I remember correctly, we did our, uh, our matrix so that one is the highest value. So you could actually just increment by 0 0.001 or 0.1 or whatever. If you're only going to have like 10 layers on top of each other, which is quite a freaking bit, then just use increments of 0.1. So like in my case, in my test scene, the, um, the grass is zero and like a fence would be one and then the player would be, or 0.1 and then the player would be Point two, so that the player is on top of the fence, but the fence is on top of the grass. All right, so after we have the depth, actually, let me go ahead and uh, go over everything in the game object class anyways. Actually, no, 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 no. I'm going to get back to it because, yeah. I'll just stay on track with that. With inspector, so in order to see it in the inspector, what we need to do is we need to push it down. So right here I just added it to the very end. So I'm just creating a float field. I'm placing it at Y96. So. Basically, it's exactly like the rest of these, except for it's uh, equaling to instead of using a function. And uh, with the rect is exactly the same, except for I'm changing, for instance, 72 to 96. And over here, offset y before was 96, so we need to push it further down. So it'll be 120. Uh, so then after that, then now we're able to actually see it in the inspector. But of course, like we know, if we don't save and load the value from the scene file, then it's not going to save, which sucks that we have to mess with the scene again just to have some depth, but that's the way it goes. So that's loading. Um, we're going to do saving first. Uh, 
So in the saving, down here in right transform, you need this right here below or above the ID part. So you can just copy this line right here, paste it right here, change rotation to depth and g.rotation to g.depth. And that's it. So now that we can save it, now we actually have to load it. So under Scene Manager, under Create Object, then under G.Rotation, we're going to put G.Depth equals float.parseFloat split 9. Now this before was split 9, but now that it's not split 9, it's actually split 11 now. And then, bam, we've got a reading in. So at least that was really simple. So now we can actually uh, manipulate the Z value and save and load it for whenever we're playing and going out of play mode. So now we actually have to add a, another set uniform. So before I never, we didn't have any float uniforms. So I actually had to add that in. Right here, it's just set uniform, string name, float, V. And then, of course, the exact same thing we're doing right here. So you can actually just copy this, paste it here, remove the other, or remove the other float, this one right here. You can just remove that part. And uh, then down here, change it to GL Uniform 1F. And then, of course, remove that, change it to a V. And then we're able to actually set uniforms, or set uh, float uniforms. And in the renderer, or now we need the sprite renderer. In the sprite renderer, now we actually have to set it. So right here at the very end of set uniforms, we're actually going to set the depth. We're going to go sprite.material.shader.setUniform, then pass in depth spelled exactly like that, case sensitive, and pass in game object depth. So now that we can actually do that, that's not what I want. That is clearly not what I want. Um, I want shader. I don't know why. Got rid of it. All right, so inside the default game shader, don't mess that up with your GY shader, but the actual game shader, uh, put uniform float depth. And then over here, right here was a zero. And instead of that zero, just put depth. And then guess what? Now you're rendering with depth. So now that that's out of the way. Now we can actually render in depth, manipulate in depth, and save and load in depth. And I will actually show you here. I do have a test scene going on. This is, um, let's see here, what was the name of it again? It was, a. Uh, We'll see whenever I load. I always have to make sure and uh, say if I'm using anybody else's stuff, which I'm using their stuff is, that's Max, Max Tile Set. Uh, he does tile sets or did tile sets for uh, whatever that 2D game engine is.
uh, our 2D RPG engine. So now we can see that I have I have two mounds right here. And this table right here is on top of this grass. Don't worry about the box collider right now. It's uh, just a it's just a skeleton and we'll go over that here in a minute. But right here is what I wanted to point out. So here I have depth to point one. The grass I have depth of zero. And hero, I have depth of 0.2. So now when I'm walking, I can, I'm always above the grass, but I'm always on top of the, uh, the table. So let's raise the table. I've raised the table to point three. We'll play that. And now I will be under the table so that it's always rendering on top of my player. All right, so that totally kills depth for us. Remove that back to point one. All right, so anybody who, well, if you if you see this animations and stuff going on, I did not, I did not go over this. This is something that I actually did right before I hit record. Is just set up a little tiny crappy basic animation system and moving, just so that we can uh, test our collision as well. And I'll go over that just so that if you're interested in learning, then, well, it's there in case you want to know. And let's test. All right, so here we go. So quickly, inside of my test, which of course extends from logic behavior. This is something that we always had. I just removed all the variables and then I added these variables. One is our move speed, which I want it as 10. So I move, uh, I move, uh, what is it? 10 pixels every second but I actually have it set to 60 inside of the editor, I believe, something like that. So here I have uh, an array of sprites, one for walking down, one for walking left, one for walking right, one for walking up, and they're all set to three. That's because each direction has Each direction has three sprites. So then I have set to current as another sprite array. And then I have walk time, which is zero. And then I have just a, just a cached sprite renderer. And uh, this is not checking if sprite renderer is null or anything. It's just straight up going, assuming that it's there. So in the start function, uh, start function is, is called once the scene starts, uh, once you hit play. So I get the renderer, which I did not go over yet, but we will, we will get to that here. Actually, I can, since we're already there, I'll just go ahead and go over it. That way I can clear game object off of here too, because I have so many scripts open that we have to go over. All right, what is it? Get render. All right, we have not gone over the collider class. So if you want, you can actually create a 
physics package. Wait. Oh, I'm in Peckerad. Uh, create a physics package and create a new JavaScript just called Collider uh, just so that we can you can get rid of this error and you can go ahead and put this and then just create a new class called Box Collider and have them inside of that physics package and then you can just go ahead and follow from here but right here I have a new private collider collider and private sprite renderer renderer now what this does anytime I add a collider or add a renderer it's going to check whether it's null or not and you're only gonna be able to have one at a time so if you already have a collider attached and you're trying to attach another collider it's not gonna work until you remove that collider or renderer and Oh, I can do that too. We also have to change our dirty, like how we handle dirty. So we need to keep our game object dirty, but we also need a matrix dirty. So inside of matrix 4x4, we need a private boolean dirty equals false, and then a getter and a setter or dirty and I can actually yes I can get rid of that okay my computer is making noises I'm gonna have to clean it out or something clean out this potato Okay. Right here. So we have public final boolean is dirty return dirty equals one. And then right under it I have public void reset dirty dirty equals zero. And this this method is already in there. And right here under the uh, matrix get method, we're checking if matrix dot is dirty. And then over here we're saying matrix dot set dirty false. So we're uh, getting and setting the matrixes dirty instead of the game objects dirty. I also added a move method so that I can actually move something instead of having to know where it's going to land, which is just a position dot add or position set the position of position dot add v for the value that we want to move. So if we want to move it one unit, we would pass in like. Uh, vector two zero one or something and then move one pixel up instead of move it one pixel from the bottom and under recalculate local transformation we have dirty equals one then we also need to set matrix dot set dirty true that way we set the matrix is dirty. Same thing down here with recalculate global transformations. And I don't think there's anything there. Uh, under set component. Okay, right here. So this is the new remove component for uh, if we're passing in a logic behavior B. 
So it's going to loop through there if components.getI equals equals B. Then we're going to say if B equals equals render, then render equals null. Uh, else if B is a collider, then collider equals null. And then, of course, the normal stuff. Uh, same thing with down here. Uh, we're saying logic behavior b equals components dot get i if b dot name equals s then if b equals render render equals null blah blah, blah. same thing for a collider um, down here in the add component now uh, I have it broken up so I'm going to say if b equals null then return which is the same thing we had before. Else if B is an instance of collider, and if the collider is not null, then we're going to just print out in our little editor saying only one collider per object is allowed, and then we're just going to return out of the method because we're not going to add anything. If it is null, then we're going to set the collider. Um, else if it's a sprite render, then check if it's null, or check if it's not null. And if it's not null, then print out only one renderer per object is allowed, and then return null, uh, set the renderer. And down here for add component string v, uh, this right here is new. So if v dot equals sprite renderer and renderer does not equal null, then of course we're going to debug the same way. Uh, now we're checking for box collider. Uh, same thing if it's not null. And then down here in the try catch, I basically just opened it up because it was just one line, which was uh, like return. We were just returning this right here. So now we're caching it to B. And then we're saying if B is an instance of collider, then collider equals B. Else, if it's a sprite renderer, then renderer equals B. And then we're returning B. Hmm. And besides that, I think that is it for the... game object prepare to render update no it's not right down here under under prepare to render so we're going to say if component.name.equals sprite render. I believe this is the same. And then we're going to say else if component.name.equals box collider, then collider.add frame collider, collider component, which we're going to get to that here in a few minutes. So it's basically just I have a list inside of the collider class, this one right here that I told you to create. There's a method called add frame collider, and it's going to take in a collider. And then I basically just add it to that, uh, add it to that list inside of that class, just so that we can, we know what exactly that frame has colliders attached to it. So then we can actually do collision detection. Uh, hold on a second. Okay. Um, now down inside of prepare objects, um, inside of the checking to see if editor dot is playing, then that's when we're actually going to call for these to actually collide is whenever we're preparing them. 
So we're going to call collider.resolveCollisions, which of course we haven't done yet, and collider.clear clear frame. But it's there. You can even comment comment this line out, this line and this line, until we actually get to it. All right, so now we can actually go back to test, and I can actually get rid of game object now. Come on. All right, so now right here, we're actually getting the renderer that is attached to the game object. So here I actually set, I set these. So under sprites, oh, I don't have them uh, refreshed. Daddy. Uh, hold on again. Ah, these kids never stop eating. Okay. So here we're just going to loop through it. Each one has three. So we're going to say walk down i equals sprite dot get and then hero plus i. And the reason is because I named these hero zero all the way to hero 11 because there's four different sets of animations, three in each one. And uh, it's lined up just like this, so that uh, the first three is walk down, second three is walk up, third three is walk right, a fourth three is walk left. So I'm saying walk down i equals sprite dot get hero i, walk up i is equal to uh, hero plus i plus three. And walk right is hero plus i plus six. Walk left is hero plus i plus nine. And that will actually set those because of the way that I named them. And then I'm just setting current to equal walk down because I want him to be facing the screen whenever he starts. So inside of the update function, um, just doing something really simple. No, make a sandwich. Okay. <laughs> uh, so if I push W, I want him to move up. So I'm saying game object up, move, uh, new vector two, zero for the x axis, and move speed for up and down. Uh, dot multiply time dot delta time and that's actually how you want to move them and then I'm saying current equals walk up and then walk time plus equals time dot delta time times uh, 2.0 f that way the animations are a little bit faster if we don't times it by two the animations is uh, kind of slow and I know that there's faster ways of doing this but I just flung through it really fast right before we I started recording so this is just how it ended up so then I'm saying else if it's a then we're gonna do uh, what to the left else if it's s we're gonna go to the right or we're gonna go down else if it's D we're gonna go right so it's basically exactly the same, you just copy and paste it down and then change change direction. Hell, this line right here is always the same. And then down here we're going to say else walk time equals zero because we want to set reset it back to zero. And then the standing sprite is going to be the first element in the current array. That way he stops and faces the same direction instead of stops and then faces the screen again, which would be stupid. 
And then right here we're saying if walk time is greater than zero, means that we're walking. And then we're gonna say int whole equals int walk time. And this right here is kind of stupid. I know that I could do it better, but, or easier. But uh, like I said, my brain's not working and I just flung it up at the last minute. So basically every quarter of a second. So every quarter of a second, the first quarter, I'm making the sprite current one. Uh, the second quarter, I'm making it the very first sprite, which would be the standing sprite up and down. And the third quarter, setting it to uh, current two, and then else, I'm changing it to the very first one again. And that's it. That moves your character around and animates it. It's pretty simple, but yeah. All right, so let's get rid of test. Is there anything in Sprite Render? Oh. Okay, so now we can actually get on to what I've done so far and we're gonna be using this to uh, to do our collision for the Momix. We're gonna use uh, bounding box AABB instead of like the original sprite size AABB. So right here we have a get inside of sprite renderer we have a get corners method now which is this method right here. It basically does exactly the same as what we do up here. It's exactly the same. We're just getting the corners. And so here's what that method looks like. Then we're, so if the sprite is null, then of course we can't get any corners. So we're returning null. And then uh, caching it to rect and then passing it back. All right, so now I can delete all that. So vector two points equals get corners. And I believe everything, these right here were already points. I don't think I changed the name of those. And that's very helpful for whenever we do collision detection because we know exactly where the corners are. And I, kind of sped through the collision methods for the moment, but uh, we'll make them better later after the tutorial series part is done. Uh, for now it works perfectly fine. So inside of Collider, we have these right here. We have a list of all the colliders that have been created. Uh, you know, all the colliders that have been created and attached to a, uh, an object. So all the colliders that are in the scene. Here is all of our movers. So movers are for instance, like a rigid body, you would say. And then solids are objects that just never move. I would call them static, but you can't name static because it's already a used variable name, so, or used name, whatever. So I just call it st or solids. Uh, so movers are objects that you want to push off of. So of course movers bounce off of solids, solids don't bounce off of movers. That's an easy way to explain it. So here, this clear method clears all the colliders in the scene. So whenever we change a scene we want to clear out all the colliders. and clear frame. This is a frame by frame method. 
So this clears out the movers and clears out the solids because every frame there could be an, an object destroyed that had a collider attached to it but that collider no longer exists. And here we're going to say add frame collider which is what we talked about earlier. It's going to take in a collider C. So we're going to check whether C is null or c.gameObject.getRenderer equals null. So if this collider is null or the renderer is null, of course we're not going to be able to do any collision because we don't have a, a sprite to work with or a collider to work with. And then we're going to say if c.gameObject is dirty, then we're going to say movers.add c. So only if the object has moved will it be a mover. If it has not moved, of course it's going to be a solid. Uh, there was, oh, that's what I was going to talk about. Um, since we're doing AABB, for the moment, we're going to get to um, get to like custom polygon collisions and stuff later. Uh, but for now, during the tutorial series, uh, we're only going to have colliders on if a sprite render exists just to make it easier. And here is our resolve collision. So basically we're going to loop through all of our movers. Then we're gonna cache the mover. Then we're gonna loop through all of the solids. And then we're gonna call resolve collision, box collider mover, box collider solid. Uh, solids.getS and then at the end of the loop down here we're going to say mover.gameObject.reset dirty so that will actually reset the dirty of the game object and here is where I left off is this method right here so private static resolve collision mover solid so here we're going to cache the mover renderer. We're gonna cache the uh, renderer on the solid object. If the renderer is null for either the mover or the solid, then we're gonna return. Or if there's no sprite attached to that renderer or to either of those renderers, then we're gonna return because we're not gonna be able to do the collision. And here we're actually getting the corners of the mover, which is poly one. And here we're getting the corners uh, called poly two for the solid renderer. Now the box collider class is really simple. It's just this right here. Public class box collider extends collider. Uh, we're gonna have a trigger and Probably in the next episode, we will uh, call like trigger methods. Triggers you don't collide, or you don't you don't respond, uh, or like reflect or whatever you want to call it. Um, you can actually go through a trigger, but then right here we're going to say public box collider collider dot colliders dot add collider this. So that just adds the collider to the list of colliders. Um, hold on, don't worry about what I'm doing right now. Uh, update FBO. I think we're done with that. That's where I was messing with the depth test. I think we're done with GUI. 
Get done with the inspector. Okay, I was just making sure that we had everything covered. All right, so, God, we're already 45 minutes in. So let's go ahead and uh, do the AABB uh, collision testing. So now what we want to do is we want to get the render bounds, the actual bounding volume of the mover and the bounding volume of the solid so we can actually do the collision. So let's say I will have to uh, hold on give me just a second I want to find out where this method is okay I was making sure that it was inside of the rect class. So we have our get intersection and our intersects method. And that's what we're going to be using for ABB. In the case you did not know, we have already done ABB or AABB multiple times. You just probably haven't realized it yet or weren't listening whenever I said that we were. But, uh, like whenever we did like culling and stuff like that. So this right here, we're actually culling it. That is collision detection. And so we're just gonna be using the exact same methods. So here, why I wanted to make sure it was all in the rectangle class is because that it, it was either create a float array or a rectangle. And thankfully we did have those methods in the rect class. So I'm going to say poly one bounds equals new rect. And I know I should cache these, but I don't really care at the moment. Just want to get it done. Um, actually, we actually have to loop. So let's go zero, 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 zero for the moment because we're going to have to loop these to actually get it. Poly one bounds, rect poly two bounds equals the exact same thing. And then we actually need to loop through these. So for i equals zero, i is okay. And i. Uh, I is lower than poly one dot length. same thing come on I'm trying to hurry up and get this done let's say um Poly one bounds dot x equals math dot men we're gonna check whether poly one bounds dot x is the minimum or we're gonna check whether poly one i dot x is the minimum uh, poly one 
actually, you know what? Let's not make let's not make another loop for that. Oh, come on, computer. change that to four because it's always going to have four because right now we're only working with uh, quads. Uh, poly two dot bounds equals poly two bounds poly two i. All right, so now we have the minimum. Maximum, so max, max, this needs to be width, right? Oh, no, x, this one's width. Width, and we're going to use this exactly like a vector four, and then we're going to change it. This is width and width. Copy those. So that actually should do exactly what we need it to do. So basically we're going to scroll through all of these points and then we're going to place the minimum and maximum values inside of here. So then we can actually create like a render frame, a non-rotated square that fits all the way uh, around our rotated square or whatever or non-rotated and then we actually need to reset this so we're gonna say um, poly one bounds dot width equals poly one bounds dot width minus poly one bounds dot x Height, height, wait, yes, height, height, change that to two.
and change this to Y. All right, so then that that tells us our rendering rectangle, our rectangle bounds. So now we can actually just say we'll just say right here. If we'll go ahead and check it first. If poly one dot or wait poly one bounds dot intersects poly two bounds. We're going to say debug dot log colliding. Just to make sure that we've got this got this correctly. Gonna, it's getting kind of light. Come on. Why aren't you going on top? So this should just say down here in our little debug menu if we collide. Whoa, what is going on here? Okay, we got something weird going on. I don't know what that was all about. It was working perfectly fine before and all we've done is mess with colliders. Don't understand why it was uh, clearing background. And I don't know why this is going behind everything. Okay, you know what, uh, let me do some tests really quick and get this going because this, this is taking forever. Alright, I'm back. I figured out what the issue was and it's because I didn't set it up right. So, uh, I'll take a break for a minute and took care of the kids. Uh, <clears throat> Alright, so one of the issues was Inside of here, I messed it up. Or wait, no, not in there. Uh, right here. <clears throat> I had it set to zero, 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 zero for both of these bounds. And I don't know why I did that. My brain just wasn't working, obviously. So X needs set to max value, Y max value. Uh, width minimum value uh, y or height set to minimum value and the reason is, is because we're calculating minimum and maximums so for the minimums we want them set to maximum that way we always get the minimum value and uh, setting the maximum to minimum so we always get the maximum And uh, while I was doing my testing, I went ahead and wrote another function in here whenever I was debugging. And that's how I figured out what I was doing wrong. Uh, here, and I 
just created a two string method just so I'd have something to print out so that I could see uh, where this rectangle is actually being created. I don't think I did anything in here. No, I was just making sure that the dirty was working right because uh, stupid me didn't put a collider on the person or on the player. So I was sitting there walking around. It was never saying that uh, that any collision should be happening with him. Had no idea why. <clears throat> so I went ahead and did this, like uh, right before I pressed record again. It's basically exactly the same thing as this, as, but instead of just checking if it intersects and then debugging, what I'm doing is I'm checking for the overlap immediately and then. Uh, if there is no overlap, then I'm debugging. And you can tell right here. <laughs> That's how I figured out that I didn't have a collider on the player. Okay, so now when I run this, and I still don't know why it is uh, loading up behind this, it's not pressing out or not popping I'm gonna have to figure that out and occasionally it's still doing that whole like rendering the blue background behind the player I don't know what is going on with that either but uh, I will get that figured out later now with the uh, intersects it intersects even if they're touching so if they're touching, it's still going to say that it's colliding. And uh, that's perfectly fine if we're going ahead and checking it if it's touching. Okay, see it's still rendering this, but every now and then when I push play, it'll just, it'll be gone and it'll be rendering normal. So I don't know what's going on with that. So let's say that I'm uh, colliding with a mound because, well, I'm touching it. If I come over here, now it's saying I'm colliding with the table. So yes, collision detection is working perfectly fine. Except for... No, it is not. see here what if I'm over here saying that I'm colliding with a table okay never mind hold on give me a second okay well apparently um, minimum value is zero or something I don't know but I know it's not what it should be I thought minimum value was negative maximum value <clears throat> but up here, change it from min value to negative max value. And then, uh, I don't know why you're not popping up on top. You're really annoying. So here I've got it. This is just showing the rectangle of this right here for debugging and colliding with mound. Colliding with a table. Colliding with a table. Colliding with a table. There. See, now it's fixed. I was just being a ding dong. Alright, so now we need to, now that we know we can detect it, now we need to actually resolve it. And the resolution for it is actually in the overlap. And that's how we actually resolve it. So right here we're going to say if, uh, if overlap dot no, 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 no.
Come on. Seriously? You're just gonna lock up on me. There. If math dot wait. No. No, I had that right the first time. I'm gonna say if overlap dot width is lower than overlap dot height then I know that we are colliding with the uh, left or the right side if This would be else. Else, then we're colliding with either the top or the bottom side. So in order to find out whether uh, we're colliding with the top or the bottom side, what we're going to, or like uh, either or, whether it's left or whether it's right, or whether it's up or whether it's down. Uh, right here we're going to offset it. So we're going to say mover dot move wait mover dot game object dot move come on and we're going to move it new vector 2 We have to actually detect it first. So we'll say if if poly one. Poly one zero dot x. So if poly one zero dot x is lower than overlap dot x, then we are colliding on the left side. So we need to say mover dot game object dot move new vector two. And we're going to move it. Overlap dot width. It'll be negative. And pass in zero. That's annoying. Else, we're going to do the exact same thing. Set four. A positive direction. Copy and paste, and then change this to Y. So if poly one zero dot Y is lower than overlap dot Y, then we're colliding with the bottom side. So zero and negative overlap dot 
height. Copy that, paste it here, and a flat dot height. All right, let's see how that works. That should be correct. Like I said, I was totally unprepared for this episode. That's why I'm kind of scatterbrained because I was trying to do OB or o, o, OBB and uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm changing the way that I'm going to do things. I want to make it a little special. Uh, so that's why I switched it back to A, 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 B, B and I did that like not long at all before I hit record, so I'm very unprepared. But hopefully this will do it. I mean, AABB is really easy anyways. Yeah, there we go. So we have collision. Looks like there's a little jitteriness. We'll get that uh we'll get that cleared up though. But yeah, so that uh that works. And that works perfectly fine. So that is a A B B collision. And so that you understand everything a little bit more, I'm going to show you exactly what these collisions are like. I know it's been it's been a little bit, but I want to kind of demonstrate how how these collisions work and how they're going to work in the future. So right here, we're going to demonstrate or kind of see how we're doing it at the moment with AABB. So with AABB, you have no rotation. It's just a straight up rectangle. There is no trapezoids or any of that crap. So it's just a standard unrotated rectangle. So say we have one rectangle, and then we have another rectangle. Well, visually we can see that this is not colliding. And how we determine that is just like how we do with like coaling for textures, GUI, whatever. We're just basically checking if, you know, this side is further away than this side and if this side is further away than this side. But we also have to check if uh, you know the whole thing is away from it because uh, like how what happened with me just a few minutes ago with the whole uh, you know zeros or uh, min value so min value say let's say zeros over here and this is like way over here whenever I move it over here it's saying that this portion right here is still way over here at zero so then when I moved it over here X is over here but width is way over here so then when I move it down it's saying that I'm colliding because this right here goes all the way across to zero all right so how we resolve this is pretty simple um, like we know how to check to see if it collides so obviously this one is colliding because well this side is further than this side and across from this side and this side is between these sides so then we know that it's obviously colliding and how we're gonna do this in the future is we're going to do um, we're also going to have the ability to make continuous collision detection which like if you've worked 
with Unity or just about any program really. You have continuous collision detection or sometimes they call it uh, like sweeping. It's basically like it does iterations from the start like the previous frame to this frame and checks collision detection on the way and then that's how you're going to get accurate collision detection. So it would start here and say it moves over here and it's like oh well we collided so then it's going to move it over here and then it's going to check in the middle here if that's collided and if it's not then it's going to do half of that and see if that collides and so on and so forth and you can actually shorten sweeps um, you only want to do sweeps on objects that are moving you would have them on like rigid bodies and stuff like that so how we do uh, how we do our checks is, as you can tell, this is overlapping. So then we want to get the actual intersection amount, which is this value right here. So whenever we resolve the collision, what we're doing is we're just checking to see whether this right here is the min or is smaller than this right here. The minimum amount of space is the direction that we're going to push it in. So if this is shorter, then it's going to push it to the left this amount. If up and down is shorter, it's going to push it down or up or whatever. And that's how AABB collision detection and response works. It's really simple. Now, with OBB or rotated rectangles or well rotated any kind of geometry really as long as it has points um, is it's a lot different because how we're doing it is we're doing the actual bounds so like right here we're doing the actual bounds, and I got a stupid circle. We're doing the actual bounding box area for our collision because we're doing O or A B B. So this is actually what our bounds look like if we actually rotated our sprite, which we don't want to do um, for now because we're doing A B B. But uh, now that it's rotated we can't do those same checks so whenever we check to see if something is colliding you have uh, several different methods and the more main one that people use is checking whether the edges uh, intersect with the edges of the other one so you check one against the other and the other against this one. So, oops. So if we look at it, then this one right here is obviously visually able to see. And there's tons of different ways you can do OBB collision detection. It's not just edges. And to show that, we have this. This is another form of collision detection, or OBB collision detection. And that is uh, basically drawing lines from the, what, centeroid or whatever you want to call it, of the uh, polygon shape and then you basically draw a line to each of the corners. If the corners, um, if the corners intersect like these sides of the other object, then it's colliding. And what's good is, is whenever you do this kind of collision detection, you already have the value right here that we're gonna push. This is the value that we're gonna push in this direction. 
because you always want to push in the opposite uh, in the opposite normal direction. This is another form of collision detection, uh, excluding the excluding these. This is another form of OBB. Now it's a little bit difficult because these this kind of collision detection is only against OBB, which is actual boxes that are rotated. So if it's a rectangle and it's rotated and you're checking against another rectangle that is rotated, then this collision detection is actually extremely fast, uh, even faster than the other methods because, well, we already have this kind of collision detection in place. And that is checking whether a point is inside of a rotated box, which we already do because we check whether we click inside of that rotated box. So those methods are already there. And the awesome thing about that is we already have bounds or uh, matrices. So we have matrices in place. And it's super simple because if we want to actually shoot this in the direction that it needs to follow, we just shoot it in the direction of this normal, which you just take this point in world space, convert it to local space of this square, and then push it out, and then convert it back to world space, and then bam, you have your distance, your actual positions that you're going to shift it. Now the issues with this is points are not always going to be inside of the other thing, like this right here. This is a triangle. And the reason why we can't do it with uh, other things besides other rectangles is because of uh, this thing right here. Um, that one? Yeah. As you can tell, Uh, like this would be a ramp and this rotated square let's say is just thrown at it or something none of these points are inside of each other so it would never actually detect it it wouldn't detect it until this box actually landed on top of one of these vertices and that's where it kind of screws up so against two rotated boxes, perfectly fine. Anything else, no, you wouldn't be able to use that method. Uh, but it's always important to just kind of play around and make your own methods. And just like this uh, point method is actually my, my own method. I never learned it anywhere else. I don't know anybody else that actually uses it. But... Uh, but it's a really easy method if you only have rectangles. But yeah, it's important just to, you know, kind of play with your own. So next we have circles. And I, I was thinking about putting circles in here, but I'm like, man, it's already gonna take enough time going over what we've already gone over, how we're almost an hour and a half in, and we've only done what, like 10 minutes of code that <laughs> that's it like real time yeah because there was a lot of other stuff that I had to do before to actually get it rendering right which obviously I still haven't because of the whole behind the character thing but uh, but circles are actually a lot faster than uh, squares or rectangles and what's good about circles is there really is no AABB or OBB collision detection. It's it's always exactly the same method to detect and it's super easy. It's just this right here. In order to check if two circles are colliding, we check 
if the center of this circle, if its radius, or if its radius plus the radius of the other circle is, uh, is greater than the center of this circle, or the distance between the center of this circle to the center of this circle, then we're colliding. If not, then we're not colliding. So it's really easy and to uh, actually fix the collision, to uh, resolve it, it's really easy as well because you actually know how much you need to resolve, uh, which is uh, so you check to see if it collides first, and if it does collide, then the equation is actually just uh, uh, the radius of this plus the radius of this circle minus uh, the distance between the center of this circle to the center of this circle. And then that, that gets the distance you need to push, and in the direction you just push it in the direction of uh, this center to this center. So it's really easy. So yeah, that is, uh, that is collision detection. So I hope I didn't bore you guys too bad. In the next episode, hopefully, hopefully we can do a little bit more uh, on the fly coding and fix, possibly fix some of this stuff maybe get finding out what's going on with that player background and uh, just kind of get ready to wrap up the wrap up the series because after the next episode it will be the final episode which is exporting the game exporting it as a game so I will see you then and have a great week